Hello and welcome to DW Academy's uh, event. I am Eddie Micah Jr. Now we have a crisis. It's global. It's a reality in all over the place in all the countries. And what all of us have learned is that um, it comes unannounced. You can manage it, but you can't control it. And we have also learned that besides the pandemic, the word infodemic has become very, very important. Refugees are people like you and me. We want the same things you do. And we fall for the same misinformation as you. I'm delighted to be back at the second year of this annual Deutsche Welle Academy conference on communication, engagement and accountability in crisis, and especially to moderate this panel, which is on cooperation between humanitarian and media development organizations. What I'm feeling is that despite the devastation that is caused by this um, pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to really focus in on community engagement and really less communication and more engagement. For us, the work, uh, especially in the space of innovation, uh, is very much centered on co-designing solutions and not parachuting solutions. So you're, uh, you're spot on. The technology is a means to an end. It is not to be used for experimenting on anyone. Now, seven speakers will present their projects and ideas. It will be a trip around the world, from Germany to Malaysia to Uganda, Cameroon, and more. Obviously, we all know that communication is a two-way road. It's not just about us giving messages to other people. People need to be able to listen and share information. It's a two-way conversation. Gathering these insights is often time and money consuming, and let, let alone unsafe. In certain areas, it's even difficult to and complicated to do your outreach because of safety regulations and access. But it doesn't have to be like this. And this is where your opinion comes in. Hagi Gawahit is an SMS misinformation management uh, system, a project that also the Community Development Center is implementing in Brian account. Long story short, through the magnifying glass of coronavirus pandemic, now it's ever more clear that providing reliable information is a primary component of humane and dignified treatment of displaced communities. Plus, a new approach is urgently needed in the asylum system, in particular in refugee accommodations, to assure the well-being of the society as a whole. The reason why we created this program is really boils down to three different things. One, there are huge social differences between people in different corners of the world. In our presentation today, we will attempt to answer the question, what challenges arise when implementing projects in a situation of conflict and enter good in another conflict? Okay, so if you can hear me, I hope you can hear me. Now, just so we're all clear, as part of our COVID-19 uh, protective measures, the studio we've normally been using uh, has been uh, shut down for now, you know, because everyone has to be protected. So uh, we're going to be winging it. It's a digital conference after all. So we're going to be working uh, or find a way around it. So don't, uh, don't mind all that you've seen around me. I seem a bit all over the place with the stuff I have. We're gonna make this work out. But with that said, hello and welcome to day three of DW Academy's first virtual conference on communication and information in displacement settings. I am Eddie 
Micah Jr. As you can tell, I'm all smiles, a bit extra today because finally my co-moderator has joined us. Hello, Wanjiku. Hi, Eddie. It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Wanji Komora, and we are your hosts for today and the upcoming days. Now, so far, it has been quite a treat. We've met so many experts on the topic, and yesterday particularly was a ride. Seven speeches from seven different countries, each in seven minutes. And if it is your first day at the conference, Buckle up, because the ride continues. The ride definitely continues. We're not going to say if it's going to be a bumpy ride or a smooth ride. It depends on how technology goes. But yeah, picking it up from what Wanjiku said, it, in just a few minutes, we'll be joined by a team from Internews. That's a media development organization. Uh, they will talk about the topic rooted in trust creating clarity about COVID-19 in humanitarian context, okay? Now, they're waiting behind the scenes already, keen to talk to all of you and engage with you in conversation. And you must be wondering, okay, how can I engage in this conversation? Well, if you've been with us over the last two days, you already know what comes next. To join our Q&A session with the experts, please register and download our conference app from the DW website. Once you're in, you can post your questions during the session and we will do our best to answer as many as possible in the Q&A session later on. So go ahead and check it out. Go ahead and check it out. Because yesterday, you know, we didn't really have a chance for you guys to ask questions and uh, get your answers. Uh, but today, as one could say, we're really going to make that time. So let's dive right into our next session. Since the 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia, Internews has played a pioneering role in the field of humanitarian communications. They've been working closely with local media and aid agencies to ensure that people affected by disaster have access to timely and reliable information in languages they understand. And that's why Internews has launched new projects in several countries to increase access to accurate, timely, and trusted information about COVID-19 while still combating mis- and disinformation. That is definitely very important. So great work they're doing. But uh, for the next 40 minutes, we're giving enough time to this team because it's a very strong team. We don't want to feel like we're cutting them. So we're going to give them 40 minutes. We'll hand over the mic to Megan Reinhardt Gale, who is the Humanitarian Director of Internews. She'll introduce you to a panel of local partners to discuss lessons learned, success, and trends related to information sharing. Okay, now it's good to have you here, Megan. Over to you. Great. Thanks so much for having me. And I will go ahead and try to share my screen. Um, oh. It looks like the screen sharing is disabled at the moment, um, but I can just go, we can just go ahead anyway. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for having us again. Um, I just want to introduce myself, as you already did. I'm Megan Reinhard Guile. I'm the Humanitarian Director from Internews. I'm joined by Irene Scott, who's our Global Project Director for the Rooted in Trust program. And then we're also joined by several of our partners who are working with us on this program. So we've got Michaela Dimpas, from, who's a Program Manager for Media and Communications from the Initiative for Dialogue and Empowerment through Alternative Legal Services in the Philippines. We have Layal Banan, who's the program manager for Maharat Foundation in Lebanon. And we've got Julio Cesar Montano, who's the director of Tumaco Radio Station, part of Fedemigios in Colombia. Uh, so we're really excited to have all of them here to discuss kind of lessons learned and creative solutions that we've all come up with as we've been, as we've been seeing one of the largest information challenges um, probably in recent history, while also seeing a decrease in our ability to go and speak to the people that we're trying to share information with. So how have we combated uh, mis- and disinformation in the time of remote COVID <laughs> in reality? Um, we focus specifically on outreach and also making sure that we're reaching the most vulnerable populations who may or may not be um, present on social media. Um, so how do we make sure that we understand their information needs, uh, the context that they're living in, and then provide accurate information that's useful and actionable for them? Uh, so Internews believes that information saves lives. Um, the root of our strategy is really helping to build healthy information 
ecosystem within the community. And that's really looking at the localized information ecosystem in relation to the larger information ecosystem. So how can we make sure that uh, vulnerable communities or marginalized communities still have a voice within, uh, within the larger community that they live? Our humanitarian approach includes community engagement. So really focusing on two-way communications, um, building bridges between stakeholders within communities to make sure that voices of marginalized groups are heard and recognized. Uh, we also focus on rumor tracking. So identifying and understanding what types of rumors and mis and disinformation are being spread within a community can also help us understand community dynamics and needs. And Irene will get into that in a bit more, a bit more in a, in a, a slide or two or a couple minutes. Um, we also really focus on accountability. So internews can act as a third party objective observer um, as we're seeing challenges within communities. So we can help again as we're bridging gaps between the health and humanitarian actors and other stakeholders. Within a community. Uh, we can help to identify needs and challenges that are arising as well within a response. Uh, so for COVID response specifically, um, the Internews Humanitarian team and our partners have been responding in over seven countries. Um, Irene is going to speak in a second about the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance supported program rooted in trust. Uh, we've served over 4 million people in probably the last six months, um, and we are really focusing on both local, local and global stakeholder engagement. So how can we take lessons learned at the local level um, ladder them up to the global level and help, help all of our health and humanitarian partners um, learn from what we're doing. So with that, Irene, I will hand over to you to dive more into uh, Rooted in Trust. Great. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Hi, Irene. I'm the Global Project Director for Rooted in Trust. It's a new project that Internews is rolling out at the moment in seven different countries around the world. Uh, we'll be operating in Afghanistan, Lebanon, Philippines, Central African Republic, Mali, Colombia, and Sudan. Uh, and the countries where we're working are really the intersection of COVID and a humanitarian crisis. You know, COVID is a communication challenge enough and it's a stress on a local population enough. But the countries where we're working are also combating economic crisis, displacement in populations, conflict, instability, natural disasters and other political crises. So what we really want to do is in these environments is really to listen to the community for the rumours and misinformation. The way that Internews uses rumours in our work is we really see rumours as an insight into the community consciousness. They identify information gaps, of course. You know, of course, they, they show where the community might need more factual information. But I think rumors are also a really great display of community trust or mistrust uh, that might be in perhaps information or in uh, health or humanitarian services. Rumors are really great insight into community fears and anxieties as well. Um, and there's a lot of that going on in this crisis, of course, but they also can point towards hope. Uh, and you see a lot of rumors circulating in communities that are fueled by a hope for a vaccine or a hope for this crisis to end as well. In the populations where we're working, we're working with humanitarian and health partners. And the idea there is that we take the rumor data, the listening that we do to the community, uh, we not do to them, do with the community, uh, we analyze that information, and we use that to uh, help humanitarian and health partners communicate more effectively. So to, to help them to understand the environment in which this rumor is circulating, and not only to be able to replace that rumor with fact, but to be able to address the environment that has allowed that rumor to spread uh, quicker than perhaps it would have. We're also working with local media as trusted sources of information in the environments where we're working. And that translates to training, of course, training in health and science journalism, uh, in the creation of demand-driven content. So content that is driven by uh, the information needs that we identify from the community by listening to the community rather than uh, content that is driven purely by an editorial meeting or a top-down approach. And by building, of course, peer-to-peer -peer systems for journalists to support each other in this crisis. You know, I think um, every aspect of our communities is being stretched by the pandemic and especially for journalists. A lot of them are now uh, expected to be experts in health and science uh, uh, journalism, which is a very complex area to be uh, a reporter in. So what we're trying to do is to really support them uh, by, of course, giving them that training, but also helping to translate some of that really quality verified health and scientific information into local languages. Um, as Megan mentioned, we're looking at a 
a global and a local response. So we're really looking at taking the latest guidance on risk communication at that global level and translating it into the context where we're working. And then of course, also taking the learning that we're having in our country context and sharing that among the project, among the organization and contributing to the discussion at those re regional and global forums. You know, the WHO reported in February that, of course, you know, COVID-19 was an infodemic. And, and what they meant by that was that there was just too much information for the community to synthesize, too much information for people to sort fact from fiction. Um, and as I said before, you know, that challenge is also for journalists. It's really hard for them to access the facts they need to do quality reporting in their local languages. And that's meaning that for a lot of journalists, they're relying on secondary reporting, reporting on someone else's reporting. Um, and those practices, of course, you know, open up gaps where, there, where misinformation or mistakes can happen that lead to misinformation. Um, I think in this crisis, we've seen that uh, we've tried facts. We've tried replacing these rumours with people. Um, and that's great. That's a wonderful first step. What we're trying to do with Rooted in Trust is uh, to understand that people will not accept factual information unless it comes from a trusted source and, and unless it fits their reality. So what we're trying to do is to understand the information gap that exists, but also that environment that has fueled the spread of that rumour. Um, there's a few ways that we, we do that and the ways that we try and respond to the rumours in this project as well. We try and understand our community. That's always a great first step with any kind of project that you're doing, especially in a humanitarian environment, but really any environment. We want to try and understand how and where they access information, who they trust, how they like to share information. And of course, within that community, you know, young people, old people, different vulnerable groups might choose to access information differently. We want to try and understand how that information is flowing through the community. We want to listen to the community's actual questions and concerns and not um, assume that we, we can guess what they might be. We want to listen to their, their actual questions and concerns. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing localised advice that's in preferred languages and advice that really fits the person's reality. So it's not, again, not a top down, very general piece of uh, prevention advice, that it's advice that fits uh, the reality of the person and receiving that information. So for example, if we're asking someone or advising someone to wear a face mask, we wanna make sure they're in an environment where it is possible to buy face masks. And if it's not, if, if they're in an environment where they're not available, to make sure we give other options. You know, to give, it, give actionable information that actually fits their reality. We call that the reality check before we share the information. We want to acknowledge people's fear. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of fear in many communities around this pandemic for a lot of really good reasons. Um, and we want to remember that, you know, most of the misinformation that's being shared in this pandemic does come from that place of fear of people be feeling generally unstable in their, uh, in their life, in their community and, and unsure of their future. Um, so it's really important in those situations as well to listen to the community, to acknowledge that fear uh, and to try and respond to those actual questions and to not to dismiss rumours as, uh, you know, ridiculous or silly or questions um, that we think we know the answer to, it's really important to acknowledge that um, we understand people and that we are actually here to continue listening. Um, we want to, on that note, of course, make sure any information we give is, is actionable information. By actionable, we mean information that gives people something they can do, something they can do in their reality to protect themselves, their friends, their family, and something that helps them feel less hopeless in this really challenging situation. Um, another key thing that we're trying to do with this project, of course, is also to report with marginalised groups. Um, there's a lot of reporting that happens in this crisis on marginalised groups, so reporting about the groups and about their, their uh, situation and their challenges, and that's, that's wonderful and really important. We want to make sure we're also making sure there is a space to elevate the voices of those marginalized groups and to really understand what their information needs are because quite often you find they might be different to other sectors of the community. And of course the most important thing is to keep listening and responding. That's something really key to our process is that we're, we're not taking one snapshot of the community's perspectives or of the community's questions. We want to be open to continue listening and responding because any piece of information we give, no matter how well we think we've thought it through or no matter how wonderfully crafted it is, there will always be follow-up questions and there will always be more questions to answer. And it's by continuing to listen and to respond to those questions that we start to build trust with the community. So I'll hand back to you, uh, Megan, for the next part of the presentation. Not sure if we can get the slides going yet. Let's see if we can. Nope, not yet. <laughs>
All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and hear from our, our partners. Um, basically introductions from each of our partners, hearing about what the work they're doing is in each country, in each context. And then we, we dive into a series of questions um, and then we'll hear a Q and A from, from the uh, participants. So Lyle, would you go ahead? Oh, sorry, Irene. <laughs> no, go for it, that's fine. Cool. Uh, Lyle, please go ahead and introduce yourself and your program. Yes, my name is Lyle Bahnam. I'm the program manager at Maharat Foundation. So Maharat is a Beirut-based organization working on media development and freedom of expression in Lebanon and in uh, the MENA region. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of, uh, of uh, studies uh, in the past related to, to the whole media ecosystem and studying like how different communities access information, etc. But in this project particularly, it's really a, 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 an approach like Irene uh, said, it's, uh, it's like listening and responding accordingly. So, so we're like uh, through this program, we're trying a new approach also for us. So, so it's not just like uh, picking up the rumors that uh, that we see on social media and then just fact checking them and addressing them and putting them there so it's a different approach uh, to, in order to try to engage with communities and feed them back with the with the with the information and to regain trust in the whole ecosystem so i will and uh, i will speak later about uh, about like the whole intervention maybe now uh, we're just introducing uh, ourselves so uh, uh, I'll speak later in details. Great. Great, no worries. Um, I'll hand it over to Kayla, who is in Philippines. Tell me a little bit about Ideals and what you're doing to respond to COVID. Hi, I'm Kayla, Program Manager for Media and Communications of Ideals. So we are based in the Philippines and have several interventions uh, all around the country. We are a legal focus organization, but aside from the provision of legal services, we believe that information is an o often overlooked aid in conflict, disaster, and even right now in pandemic situations. So we kind of do that too. So our information as aid project, uh, which is being supported by Internews, is it's largely based in Mindanao. Uh, so just for context, uh, communities in Mindanao experience continuous armed conflicts, uh, bouts of displacement, poverty, and now they are being greatly affected by the pandemic. So I'll talk about the project also later on. Thank you. And in Colombia, we're working in the south of the country in a region called Nariño. And so I'll hand over to Julio. So Julio, please introduce yourself. and and tell us a little bit about what your organization is doing. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wait in this moment. <laughs> um, um, I am in company with Marta Arboleda. She is the executive director of CADE, the main organization uh, to the Tumaco Stereo Station. Um, our organization uh, focuses on to teach uh, folk uh, culture and, communi and communication. We have two two ways: is culture, cultural expression, and we using the Tumaco Stereo our radio station. Um, uh, we believe. Um, the communication and culture is the is the strategy to teach and communicate to the people. Uh, our, our organization is in Tumaco, Nariño, Colombia, in Pacific Coast. Uh, we're working with Afro-Colombian community. Um, the other thing is um, for us in Tumaco, the when talking about the pandemic pandemic or the COVID-19 is be surprised because the public service in our country is a lot of we have a lot of problems um, we have to reinvent to create different situation for for make some solution for this problem for this reason in our organization so the radio station has to create a special program and the name is the name is 
infect with the dance and not the COVID. What do you think? I'll just explain about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting uh, to um, let you know about our uh, experience in Tumaco. Um, through the, the radio station and our uh, cultural organization, we try to provide reliable information to the community because we started uh, facing um, many myths that um, the community start like, for example, um, COVID-19 virus can not stay in hot and humid uh, climates. It's like, it, this is real, we have to care of this because even though we are in the hot weather all the time, we have to be careful with this. We uh, also, black people don't get COVID. We are black. We can gain things. We, we start working from, from that part. It's like, let us uh, get the, informa the, the reliable information to the community that we need to care, we need to follow, and, um, and we need to, uh, continue following the protocol for caring of the of the COVID. Um, and then we our radio station we create a program uh contagiate de la danza not the COVID, con be contagious of the dance, not the COVID. Uh, because we use uh, our 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 kit, our tool uh, of dance or 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 um acting or, or, or play games with the children, with young people, because this is our group and we use that to, to let the people know we can use this to create, to recreate this new situation. Um, the, the program has um, like, we, we care of the mental health people, mental health of the people. Uh, we, we work with, uh, with artists, with poets, trying to use the, the, the lyric to, to let the people be careful. We have to, we have to care of this because we have to protect each other. If you protect yourself, you protect me and you protect the community. That it was a, a, the everyday message. If you protect yourself, you protect your family, you protect your town, you protect your country. It's like, yeah. Do um, yeah. Also, we, as an organization, we have to recreate the, 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 the our own um, work, our program. We have to start learning how to be um, virtually. We have to yeah. also has to uh, we have to be with with na in and in, in our town. We love how we can let the, the, the community be, be informed. Use the radio station, use the program, use the, the artists, talk with the community, go to the community. But do not forget, be away from people, sit feet, and wear your mask, and use your glass, bring your hand sanitizer, um, but don't, don't, don't leave the community. Be there. We can, that we used to start being in the community, we also provide food for the community because uh, we are in a small town. The people live from day by day situation. This is another thing that made hard for us. It's like we cannot be in, in the home all the time. We have to go to fish. We yeah, and I think for our people. Sorry. Yeah, and I think that's a really, really good point that you made there, that you need to be part of the community, but also, you know, it's, it's quite challenging in these times where we're, especially for artistic expression, we're used to being together with people, dancing with people, you know, up in each other's faces, which is obviously something that, that can't happen during the pandemic. So, um, yeah, really interesting to see how you've um, modified your programming to make sure you can still use radio and 
provide that that entertainment, but also the education at the same time. I, I wanted to ask you, Lael, um, working in Lebanon, um, it's it's clearly a country at the moment that is facing multiple challenges. Um, of, of course, there's an ep economic crisis. There was the blast that also happened in, in August. There's a, uh, quite a large refugee population there. I'm really interested to know how your organization is managing, I guess, the, the multiple pr different information priorities that your community will have at the moment. COVID is not going to be the only thing they're thinking about. Yes, exactly. Uh, you are right. So, so I, in, in Lebanon, like you said, there are too many challenges. So it's not COVID-19. COVID-19 came to add to other challenges. So we have like uh, all the, the, the corruption and the, the protests that started in October and uh, stopped after that with the, with the COVID-19, the resignation of two governments, and now we don't have any government, the depreciation of the local currency, etc. So we have like big problems and then the, ex the explosion. Uh, we have very big challenges and all that within lack of trust. So there is no trust in public institutions. And this is a major challenge when we talk about uh, accuracy of information and also uh, access to information. So uh, the public communication of the public administrations is absent because there is this gap in trust between citizens and between the government. And as you said as well, there's the refugees in Lebanon, both Syrians and Palestinians that are not acknowledged in anything by the, by the government when it comes to uh, information. So even if we want to talk not about only the COVID, let's say the explosion that happened. So the explosion in 4 August till now, no one has any information, nor about, neither about the, the, the AIDS, uh, the transparency, uh, uh, the, 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 the food that is in the port, how much it's still like, uh, uh, how, how much it was impacted by, by uh, the explosion, by the nitrate, etc. So we don't have information in all the feeds. And this is like reflected as well when we talk about COVID-19. So despite that the Minister of Information was trying like to, to disseminate information related to COVID-19, but you have all the time like people not believing because they do not trust this, uh, this, uh, these public administrations. So if they were talking about the number of deaths, people would say, no, it's not true. They want to take additional more money. This is why they are increasing the number of people who are, uh, who, who are dying. Uh, a lot of examples. So, so um, that leads us to uh, uh, like, there's like a, a, a gap between between the the public institutions and the, and the citizens, including the most vulnerable, that are refugees, both both uh, Syrian and uh, Palestinians, and also Lebanese people, because now with the economic situation and the deterioration, like more than 60% of the Lebanese are now from the poor population. So um, this adds as well to ongoing, uh, ongoing crisis related to media itself. So the media institutions were also contributing some, somewhere in spreading misinformation. So traditional, we have also issues with traditional media because they are affiliated. Uh, uh, also, they are within the same political, uh, political affiliation and, and like a, content, a reflection of the political system. So, so it's not also, trust is not built towards media institutions themselves. And this is another layer of, uh, of the challenges. And when it comes to independent media platforms as well, so they are struggling with viability. Uh, and this is also something that we've been working a lot, uh, a lot uh, at Maharat in partnership as well with the Chevelle Academy, who's hosting this, uh, this panel. So we've been working and studying how like opportunities can be given to, to more viable independent platforms that can play this role in regaining trust in the, in the media content, because this is a huge issue when we talk about, about citizens that are informed, especially the vulnerable communities, where the more rumors are circulating mainly, not only on social media, but unfortunately in, in, in closed WhatsApp groups. So, so, and this is also a major challenge for all the organizations and media institutions who want to work on, on countering misinformation and responding to, to misinformation. 
So this is why I said that this approach that we are using with internews is a very, very like, uh, uh, is a new approach actually for us because it's listening from, from the communities and feeding back into their, uh, their, uh, yeah, their communication so that uh, it, is, it, it will have some impact either on the communities that are sharing uh, rumors and uh, misinformation uh, uh, and also on, uh, on uh, international organizations uh, uh, and the journalists by listening as well to their needs rather than implying some kinds of trainings that maybe they, they won't need. So, so all the approach uh, uh, is like based on the on the on on listening to to different communities can contributing in this information information circle if you want yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, it's really challenging in an environment where um, quite often uh, you would assume the government is your trusted information source. You would assume that there is a level of trust in the media. And when the media has no one to go to for their verified information and the community has no one to go to for their verified information, they are reliant on friends, family, social media and information that that might not be verified and, and might not be the quality um, that is going to help them in a crisis. So th yeah, thank you for giving an insight into the, the media ecosystem and the information ecosystem there in Lebanon. I think it's it's really complex at the moment and, and I very much appreciate that we have you on board as our partner to help uh, work with some of these challenges. I, I wanted to go over to jump over in my imaginary plane over to the Philippines now and to have a chat to Kayla from Ideals. Um, as you were saying before, you're working with uh, communities there that have been affected by crisis in the past and also communities that are sometimes quite uh, isolated uh, in where they are. I, I'm interested to uh, hear a little bit more about how you adapted to COVID and, and specifically around some of the wonderful radio programming that you've been doing both on air but also through social media. So I guess aside from the need to procure a lot of personal protective equipment for our local community <laughs> controllers, uh, our programming has changed in terms that um, there is a shift in the information and themes that we needed to highlight and how to get and actually relay those to our community partners. So pre-COVID, uh, Mindanao communities already have difficulties in accessing basic needs, having a livelihood. And with COVID right now, uh, they need to ensure that their families are safe from the virus on top of everything else that they've been experiencing for so long. So this has affected their priorities. And ensuring whether the information that they got is accurate or not, or if a rumor is harmful or not, is not any more part of their daily priorities because they have mouths to feed. And our goal, our role really is to respond to these challenges and treat them as opportunities in our programming. So the best way that we did that is actually by tapping local capacities uh, to be as non-intrusive as possible and to represent community interests by bridging dialogues um, between communities and duty bearers. So first we tapped um, local community patrollers to gather information on the ground. Um, they hold listening sessions, um, consultations with um, other community members on community-based rumors or pertinent disinformation that we may not be able to gather online. And then um, from those consultations, we also capacitate them to become champions who the people can actually ask if an information is true or not. I think this is a really important facet of our strategy because of the huge language barrier um, in Manila, in the provinces, and even in those provinces, there is a huge language barrier. And then the fact that there is um, intermittent cellular signal, electricity, people there have no smartphones or access to internet. So our local community patrollers, they feed us with the information and together we actually um, produce materials that are, are responsive to the context and to their needs. And then they bring it back to their communities. Um, they're somewhat like Google, but they're on the ground and real, and they are <laughs> actually real people who the communities trust. So those are the things for our 
community patrollers, but of course we need to reach a wider audience as well. So the, um, we use our radio programs, which has been um, airing for over three years now. And it started actually in 2017 uh, during the Marawi siege, which is the longest urban conflict in the, in the history of the Philippines. So we aired those radio programs through targeted pub public address systems and streamed to social media because, of course, um, in situations like this, we need to um, use as many platforms as possible to reach as many people as possible. But of course, our um, productions, our materials must be responsive to the context and are actually based on a needs assessment by community patrollers and locals as well. Yeah, I think that's really, really fascinating, Kayla. Thank you so much for, for giving us that background. Um, and, and for those of you that haven't seen their programming, you know, we'd love to be able to share a link to um, some of the social media programming that has happened. Um, it's happening in local languages. And I think that's a really important point to make there because um, obviously a lot of countries do have a lingua franca. They have, you know, the most common language that people speak. Um, but especially when we're talking about a health crisis, um, people need to be able to speak in the, the language they're most comfortable expressing themselves in. In. That's where they're able to, uh, of course, express themselves most clearly, uh, where they're able to understand information more clearly. And in a health crisis where we're dealing with very complex scientific information and scientific information, which is updating sometimes on a daily basis, um, I think it's really crucial to be able to communicate in local languages that people prefer uh, so that more people, of course, can access that quality information. Um, Kayla, could you give us a little um, background as well in the languages that you're using for, for the programming and, and why those languages were chosen? Um, so in our programs, um, the local languages are chosen because, um, for example, in Lanao del Sur, in Mar uh, Maranao is a spoken language, really, so they have no... Um, official written language and people there do not know our are not well versed in english or not well versed in other um bigger more common languages so we use that so they can actually um yeah express themselves and even in maguindanao those are the languages that are commonly used by the elders uh the vulnerable and marginalized communities that we want to target so we use those long local languages. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's really key because when we talk about there being an infodemic as well, um, I think, you know, all of us would have experienced in the context where we're working, when we take information from one language and we transfer it to another, there is that possibility of misinterpreting information uh, and for changes to be made, not intentionally at all, um, that then lead to rumors. So um, being able to have that quality information in someone's original language is, is really key. Um, Julio, I, I wanted to throw another question to you. Um, before we open it up to the floor and see what our, our wonderful participants in this section would like to know from you all. Um, but while I still have the mic, um, I would love to know a little bit more about the, the radio pro programming that you're doing at the moment. And of course, the area where you're um, operating, where Tumaco is, uh, also has a high number of Venezuelan migrants as well. So how do you make sure that you adapt to the information needs of the migrant population and the other various populations that also live in Tumaco? I think coming Leo, off you're mute. Still on mute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Tumaco is the small hometown close to Ecuador. Forever the migrant came to Ecuador. But the other thing, Tumaco have the population, the Tumaco population is like 138 because it's a small. But right now, we have the big problem because the immigrant coming to, came to Venezuela. In this, in this case, we create, we create another program with the Fedemedios to try to make more visible these people and to uh, close to the, the myth because 
a lot of people say the Venezuela population came to Colombia and made a big social problem. For this reason, with the Fede, with Fede Medion, we create a different program. Also, just to uh, put a little bit, put, put little more things there. Um, <clears throat> as organization in as a Tumaco organization, we have to make a partnership with different uh, others right. uh, um, organizations that work for the community and like like I say, real organization that trash uh, the information we gave them. We, <clears throat> sorry, we made a partnership with Fede Medios and um, Sindamanoi organization. It's like you work in, in global level that we, we can say for the medios. We go we go the city by city, we work with uh, uh with Sinta Manoy and Tumaco work with the little town. It's like we can work with the whole community involving the because at that time before the pandemic we got a lot of uh um, Venezuelan immigrants. And we cannot leave them outside of the community because even though they are from over there, now they are part of our community. We have to work with them too. We have to bring information. Also, some of them are not home. How the people in the street can protect from the COVID-19? Because uh, if, like, like I say, if you protect yourself, you protect me, and you protect the community, and they are part of the community. That's why we start. Uh, making partnership in other organizations to, to, to deal with the whole community. Mm -hmm. Now we, our town, no, it, it, you are part of mm -hmm. us. Now we have to care of you too. That's we deal with the situation. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I think what's, what's really interesting with some of the work that we'll be doing with um, the organizations that we have in Colombia is uh, working with migrant liaison officers who are of course, migrants from that community who will be able to talk to us about the, the questions and the concerns that the migrant population has about COVID-19. Um, and, and also at the same time is training them to create their own content. So again, they're creating content that directly addresses their questions and concerns for their community and is made by them as well, which comes with that, that additional level of trust. It's by them and, and for them. Um, I wanted to hand it back to Megan. I've been hogging the mic. Uh, <laughs> Megan, did, did you want to jump in at this stage? Sure. I mean, just to say thank you to our partners. And I think this just really highlights the need to, to have those relationships on the ground with local communities. And um, as you were just discussing in Colombia, like getting down to every micro community and creating partners within each of those so that there's representation across as many groups as possible. Um, when we're thinking about an information response and when we're thinking about communicating with communities that we actually are being inclusive when we say that. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I will hand back to the moderators and we can start to get some questions from participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan and Irene for leading that insightful discussion on how to increase access to accurate and timely information for refugees and migrants. And my takeaway uh, I have many, but some of my takeaways have been that in a health crisis, local languages, especially the spoken languages need to be integrated. And also using real people who are part of the community builds trust. I hope the viewers also have gotten to enjoy that. Eddie, I'm sure you also have something that you've taken from this discussion. Oh, I have, I have many takeaways, Wanjuku. And first of all, many thanks to you guys. If you've really said a lot, there's just so much you guys are doing on the ground. Uh, Wanjuku, one of the key takeaways is for me, uh, the mental part of, the, uh, of this, because, you know, we're, we're treating corona very physically in most situations. You know, wash your hands, do this and all. But there's a lot of people that have been mentally affected by this. And one of you, you guys, or some of you guys mentioned that. So when we have the time, I would like uh, to really delve into what's the best way to deal with people that are going through uh, such uh, mental situations. But Wanjuku, like you said, we really want to involve uh, the people or the participants, I should say, that have been in this. So maybe we should get to that straight away. That's right. If you haven't done so already, please use the Q&A section right next to the live stream to post your question. Yep. So, so Eddie, I... you want to get, get us started on some of the questions that we've already received so far. I can definitely do that. Let's uh, start with uh, one from, uh, he called himself Muthi. 
Muthi uh, Ben Saud is asking Leila this question, but I'm sure anyone else can pick up after Leila. Uh, the question is, Leila, how do you get people to trust independent media channels in politically charged countries like Lebanon? What are ways that worked and ways that did not? Uh, yes, so so uh, it's a very uh, very good question. Actually, it's very challenging, and you know, even because you know, we have the, at Maharat we have a fact checking uh, uh, website as well. So and it's very challenging in countries that are this much divided. Even you cannot rely on the opinion of an expert to say that this is an evidence based information. So you have to do a lot of research in order to find like uh, factual and evidence based information. And like there is like additional challenge related to lack of access to information. So even though we have an access to information law, but public administrations are not uh, are not cooperating uh, with providing information. So whenever you want to access data, you cannot. They will tell you it's within the exceptions, or they will not provide you with this data. So it's very challenging for independent platforms. To, to be independent, actually, and, and to be based on, on, on facts and evidence-based information with the lack of data and with this division at affecting as well experts. So it's a hard work, but uh, at least like we have some criteria that, uh, that we try to follow when we talk about independent journalism, so not being affiliated, uh, trying to provide evidence-based information, uh, uh, so, so you have to, 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 to have a real knowledge of the, of the ground and the context in order to do this assessment so that you say these are independent platforms trying to provide like more in-depth journalism because unfortunately the mainstream media, we don't find in-depth journalism. So we have like, we do a lot of media monitoring studies for the traditional media and one of the main findings, the lack of in-depth reporting. So it's only news and statements of politicians. So one of the criteria to say that this platform is, is independent or not, so looking at the content, whether it's quality journalism, providing in-depth uh, content that is based on, uh, on evidence and data. But it is not easy. Thank and you. Thank you so much, Laila. Uh, Megan, you want to jump in on that as well? Uh -huh. Yeah, I would just add as well that understanding kind of what the dynamics are that are creating the lack of trust in independent journalism or in other institutions that are sharing information is really important because then you can cater how you're sharing that information to different types of groups that kind of address those root causes of lack of trust. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't combat, you can't just provide good information. You also have to be understanding what the dynamics are in which you are presenting that information. Thank you so much. Uh, still on the questions, this one is from Barnabas Samuel, who asks, beside uh, community patrollers, what other ways and tools did you use to track rumors? How do people share with you rumors or misinformation they have in the communities or channels that you use for giving back community feedback? I think this goes uh, directly to Michaela Fast, who talked about the community patrollers, and then everyone else is obviously um, open to jump in. Michaela, please. Okay, uh, so aside from directly tapping community patrollers, we also held um, some sort of coffee session with the uh, traditional religious and even youth leaders. And then we held um, very informal sessions, just talking because we, in our communities, um, they somehow have a fatigue on surveys, on um, important official things like that. So what we did re really is tapping those people um, who are already ingrained in the community and then being as informal as possible while um, introducing um, what we are doing, so which is tracking rumors. So aside from face-to-face -face interactions, we also opened up all... Uh, possible platforms. So we have a hotline uh, so people can text in their concerns or any disinformation that they um, have come across. And then our social media, our Facebook pages, our messenger is also open. And then um, even during the radio program, um, 
it streamed live on Facebook so people can actually send in their questions uh, real time and then we can debunk or uh, combat any misinformation, rumors, or disinformation um, real-time as well. So yeah, really it's about opening up um, every possible platform for people to have um, access to um, countering these kinds of information trends. Would anyone, thank I, you so much, Michaela. Would anyone like to jump in also on that response? I would love to jump in. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, definitely um, adding to what Kayla has said, I 100% agree. It's about using a number of different channels. You know, while social media is definitely a breeding ground, it's the nursery, perhaps for some rumors. It's a place where rumors go to spread very quickly like wildfire and to, to move from social media to the community. Uh, it's not the be all and end all. Um, and only listening to social media does mean that you're always missing a sector of the community everywhere in the world. Uh, even if it's a country that has really high access to social media and really high use of social media, there are always groups in the community that will not be using it. And by only collecting rumors from social media, we're excluding them from the conversation and we're saying uh, that we don't want to listen to their opinion. So I think what's been really important for us in the Rooted in Trust project in the seven countries where we're working is using multiple streams. So trying to, again, understand how the community communicates. Um, if it is social media, looking at, of course, the public posts that are available, Twitter, um, some of the public Facebook pages, but also talking to the community and saying, where do you have these discussions? Are there groups, if per perhaps, you know, in some of the locations, there are particular groups that refugees choose to use to have these discussions rather on public forums. Where else can we go to listen to you? Um, it's also about working with local media, perhaps through Talkback Radio, about the kind of calls and questions that they're getting from the community, face-to-face -face sessions, as Kayla said as well, um, and, and really working with the community to communicate in the way and collect the information the way that the community chooses to communicate. Um, so starting with understanding the community is always really important for uh, getting a thorough picture of the rumors that might be circulating. Speaking of communities, AD, I believe we have another question from our q and session. Yeah, we do. You know, at this, at this stage, Wanjiku, I'm really itching to ask uh, about a billion questions that I have, but we don't have too much time to get into that. This is another one from um, Muthi Binsad, who says, um, Hi, Michaela. How do you pick these? Have we not done that already? How do we pick these communication patrollers? If we've not tackled that, then maybe you can mention something on that. Um, so the community patrollers that we've tapped are mostly um, part of the youth sector because they are not only digital natives, but there is also a growing um, body of youth in the area that wants to actually create social change, wants to volunteer. So um, aside from, of course, the age factor, we want community patrollers who are active, already active in their communities. So most of them are already part of the um, youth council or are part of other organizations. And um, we also put prime in tapping those who, are, who have a media background. So these are um, senior high school students or college students who are in university and who are currently um, um, studying media because they also produce um, media productions aside from you know listening to the community. So yes, yeah, so we just want young, active, and those who really want to uh, combat these rumors because they see the need for it in their community. Okay, that's great. And so, what you I know you to oh, sorry, Megan, oh, I would very just briefly add one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we also really think about is having a diversity of community patrollers. So, if you want to be hearing from um, an elder, elder elderly group, you want to have somebody that they're comfortable with speaking with them and kind of representing them. So, people should be representing themselves. Um, so, you want to have a very diverse representation of of groups within those community patrollers. So, you're getting as as wide a range of information needs and, and opinions as possible. Okay, that's great. Why don't you go? I know you and I have uh, quick questions. You want to go first? Yes, thank you very much, Eddie. Um, <laughs> actually, my question is to Julio. Um, because you talked a lot about how you're engaging artists uh, of different forms, uh, dance, poetry, and so on. 
in talking about and debunking the myths around COVID. And my, I just was wondering, what are some of the challenges that you have experienced working with artists in, in the current pandemic we are all going through? Perhaps you could tell us briefly, I know Eddie is also waiting to ask his question, but, uh, and how you overcome these challenges. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a debate who, who is going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like a tag team. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, uh, especially in, like I said before, uh, we don't have the, the real world in uh, uh, We don't have the, the good uh, systems to communicate with people. We also, we have to use the, take a risk, uh, going to the community, like following the uh, COVID uh, precaution. But it, it was challenging for us because at this time, um, people scary, people is not on the street. People, also people, is, another people is not as scary because they have to work for food. Um, but uh, it was very challenging for the, especially for the uh, radio station, because we are now a B station and we need to provide real information to the to the people. That's why we decide why are we beat, beat, uh, like two, like weapon, like it's the dance. How we can talk with our own, um, um, group, our, our heart, our soul. We have to use our soul. Because when you introduce for your veins and navigate with the thing you you feel like the music, let the let the artists talk about how they are doing this, how they are are, are um, assisting in this pandemic. Because it was hard, super hard. Yeah, we all the the poet, we involve the musician, we involve the dancer, because in when the people talking is like singing <laughs> and the people walking like dancing <laughs> but then we use the old language traditional language um one is through the the music uh, the musician create the song and with the beast involve the message to say okay come on go stay home uh, follow is. Follow, follow the all, all precaution. Uh, the other thing is like the, to painting, the people to paint, create some image to explain that. And the other is the dance. The dancer dancing with the, with the music, it is like this, yeah? And the other is the lyrica for the song. And this song thing, Okay, stay home, don't go out, follow the rule like this, watch it, you hang, everything. Wow. And then is go to talking faith by faith to the people because the especially the old old person, the adult person don't want to listen. Yeah, because mm. I don't have the phone, the the, the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you, you are struggling to compete with uh, technology and passing on a message. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish we had even more time to continue with this, you know, just exploring, exploring the different types of languages we can use to communicate. But Eddie, you also had a question. Yes, I also do. And uh, you're right. We wish we had uh, five hours to discuss all of this. The thing is, the first two days, Wanjiku, we finished a bit earlier. I mean, yesterday we finished 10 minutes to time so i don't know about the organizers if they will give us I don't know, maybe two three four minutes maybe because my question is about mental health right um i've already mentioned it a bit we normally focus on how not to get uh, the, the coronavirus and uh, how to protect yourself from others and all that very physical practical things but for those that have had to stay at home uh, due to lockdowns those that have very little or no human interactions uh, from all of this lockdown it has its toll on them mentally first of all how easy is it to address this and 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 how do you really go about this briefly anyone can jump on this in this case yeah so i guess i i, I yeah i guess i would say that you know 
our project isn't um, isn't a mental health program, but what I what I would say is that it, it's really important in the way that we're responding, and that's part of us making sure that any information that we're providing is actionable, um, you know, and that really does start to combat a little bit of the hopelessness that people can feel. Being at home, alone, uh, separated from their community, from their friends and their family is very isolating. Um, but if you can give people things that they can do, things that they can do to uh, contribute to their own recovery, um, that's a very small thing that information can do to help to combat um, some of the, the mental health challenges. I think one of the other things we wanted to mention as well is that, you know, media is also a, a big part of this project. And for the journalists that have been reporting on this crisis, especially in the environments where we're working, where they're not only reporting on COVID, they're, uh, they're dealing with the, the health and safety issues of uh, the fear of being in, infected themselves and the risks that they might be facing in doing their, their normal everyday work, um, that it's really important to acknowledge, I guess, the mental health pressure that's also on the journalists that are, that are trying to report on this crisis and on the many other crises that are affecting them in their countries and that um, you know additional vicarious trauma that does add pressure on them um, while they're trying to do their work so it's it's crucial mental health is, is a challenge I think for everyone in this crisis yeah. um, for the first responders and and for people who are at home um, you know trying to protect themselves and their friends and their family Eddie there's nothing else I could ask for more other than time, obviously. But that is a lovely note to end on because I feel like we've captured both the physical part with dance and, you know, um, bodily expression, but also understanding that the information that we are disseminating as, uh, as key players or stakeholders in this particular topic is important. Uh, it's important to also keep in mind the mental well-being of the people who are consuming the information. Mm -hmm. Thank you and Wajiku, so Wajiku, much. not to cut you even, but I think one key thing that I think we're all taking uh, away from this is, is as you and I as journalists, right? The, the kind of information that we keep putting out there, it has been so much depressing news during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think where we can come in is also try to do so many different things just to keep people's minds at ease still while uh, letting them do the right things to prevent it from spreading. Definitely. Yes. I'm very sorry. I have to cut us short because time is tight. Yeah. However, the good, I have some good news, even though I'm cutting us short here. Um, on the conference app, we can carry on this discussion because it's clear that there is still a lot more that we can say, that we can share. And we have had questions from our viewers as well. So please, if you're watching and want to get on in touch mm -hmm. with uh, our experts, please go to the conference app, leave your questions, let us keep discussing. I want to say a very heartfelt thank you to everyone that has joined us, especially our panelists. I have to say, we have people who are um, at 9.35 p.m. in the night. We have others on our panelists who are at 8 a.m. So we're scattered across the world. And we thank you so much for making the time for us. We thank also everyone who has asked any questions uh, from our app. And what else can we say? Eddie, what can we expect tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is going to be another mega day. We'll talk about women's leadership in crisis communication. Uh, this session will feature two presentations. One will take us to Liberia. Action Aid Liberia's Head of Programs, Patience Lanford, will speak about the COVID-19 response over there, in particular around women's leadership. And the second session will be brought to us by Tribal News Network and highlight the stories of Mamar Afridi and Razia Masood, who are among the first professional female journalists from the Kiber Tribal District and Pakistan's Waziristan region. Both women were internally displaced before becoming voices of their communities. Mm. Now, you have more than enough reason to join us uh, tomorrow. And all of you guys I'm watching right now today, you should also join tomorrow's discussions because it's going to be very great. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I am Eddie Micah Jr. And my name is Wanji Komora. Catch you on day four, same place, same time. Goodbye. Goodbye.